Okay, up until now we've been considering aromatic rings uh, in the context of just of just monocyclic systems, so just a single ring. So we've considered things like benzene, we've considered heteroaromatics, we've considered aromatic ions. Uh, the question we want to answer in this video is what happens if we have aromatic systems that uh, have multiple ring systems? Now, strictly speaking, Huckel's rules that we've learned only apply to monocyclic aromatics. So uh, when you're thinking about the, the 4n plus 2 rule, um, it really only concerns things like uh, benzene and uh, other monocyclic systems. Uh, but that doesn't mean that aromaticity can't exist in other contexts. And so, example, for example, we can have uh, aromatic uh, systems with, with two rings. Uh, naphthalene is sort of the, the quintessential um, bicyclic aromatic. Um, so this is the structure of naphthalene. Um, this is actually the chemical that used to be used in mothballs. So if you ever uh, smell old mothballs, that what you're smelling is simply naphthalene. Um, it's not necessarily the most pleasant smell in the world, but it's not overly offensive. Anyway, as you can see, naphthalene sort of looks like uh, two benzene rings kind of fused together. Okay, um, and if we take a, a closer look, if we think about resonance forms for naphthalene, we could actually draw three different resonance forms, just shifting these double bonds around. Um, and so it, this sort of reminds us of what we uh, saw with benzene, where we've got a lot of different resonance forms, um, which we equate with stability. So what is the, the aromatic um, situation with naphthalene? Well, if we think about the uh, p orbitals involved, um, we would recognize that each of these carbons is sp2 hybridized. So each one is contributing a p orbital with a single electron. Um, and uh, this certainly satisfies the criteria um, of, for aromaticity where we've got complete cyclic conjugation. So this is completely uninterrupted in a ring. Um, and uh, it, it certainly is planar as well. Um, and, and then if we count up the electrons, we can actually see that there's uh, 10 pi electrons, which is one of the Huckel numbers. So in a certain way, if you sort of forget the, the Lewis structures and forget about the fact that there is in fact a, a single bond in naphthalene that, that splits us into two rings and we only consider the pi system, um, we can actually you know, uh, squint our eyes and, and make this look like one big aromatic around the periphery. And that actually is sort of how that, uh, how, how naphthalene acts. <clears throat> so in a certain sense, we, we actually could draw a different form of naphthalene um, where we might draw the sort of this big elongated donut uh, that would extend um, over both rings. Um, now, to be clear, um, no self-respecting chemist ever draws naphthalene this way. Um, if anything, um, you might draw two individual donuts. Um, but to be fair, this is actually um, not so inaccurate um, in terms of the, the conjugation throughout naphthalene. Okay, well, let's talk about energetics though. So uh, naphthalene is very much considered aromatic. Um, and you can see by the criteria that we just talked about that it, that it should be aromatic. Um, but it turns out that the resonance stabilization um, in naphthalene is not as much as in benzene, right? So the aromaticity doesn't get you as much in naphthalene as it does in benzene. And we can look at this uh, quantitatively uh, uh, by, by means that we can talk about in lecture. Uh, but the, the number happens to be, for benzene, uh, a resonance stabilization of, of 36 kilocals per mole. Okay, so this is how much benzene is stabilized versus what you would expect if it was just a cyclohexatriene. Okay, so 36 kilocals per mole, that's actually a very large number, um, reflecting the very deep stability of something like benzene. Now, if naphthalene was simply two benzene rings fused together, you might expect that the uh, aromaticity, the resonance stabilization of naphthalene, would be simply two times that of benzene. So we might expect 72 kilocals per mole for naphthalene. But in fact, if you run the experiment, what you find is only 61 kilocals per mole. Right? So that's significantly less than twice benzene. And so that's a general phenomenon that 
the more uh, rings you have in the aromatic system, um, the less stabilization per ring that you're going to have. Okay, um, and there's multiple ways that we can explain this. One um, very simple explanation uh, would be to uh, fall back on the, the resonance picture. So if we think about the, the three resonance structures, again, down here, right? Um, if we think about um, when is each ring um, benzene-like in character, meaning when does it have um, the three double bonds that are uh, un uh, uninterrupted um, in that cyclic conjugation. And so uh, what we'll just do on the bottom here is just draw in a little donut every time we have that situation. So on the left structure, we've got a little donut on the left-hand ring, but then that actually leaves the right-hand ring with, with just a dienyl component. Right? It's just a diene and, it's, and, it, and it lacks that, that full conjugation because there is no formal double bond right there. Okay, so just one of the rings is, is aromatic or benzene-like in character in that resonance form. In the middle, we've got both of them, right, because that double bond is shared between the two rings, so both of them can feel like benzene. And then in the one on the right, only the right-hand ring is benzene-like. So what you can see is that each of the rings in naphthalene is only fully aromatic in two-thirds of its resonance structures. Okay, so the, the numbers don't work out exactly, but um, 61 versus 72 um, and just from a, a simple resonance point of view um, that provides um, at least a conceptually simple explanation okay so in terms of reactivity then um, it, it turns out so naphthalene as an aromatic will certainly undergo um, many reactions that benzene undergoes um, and again we're going to talk about uh, aromatic reactions in a lot of detail in the next unit um, but remember, we've already talked about the bromination of benzene, where you treat benzene with Br2 and a catalyst, and you could do a substitution reaction. So naphthalene will absolutely also do that type of substitution chemistry, but it will, um, in certain circumstances, also do reactions that alkenes uh, undergo, right? So you all learned about epoxidation when you learned about alkenes. So if we were to treat an alkene with MCPBA, which is this per acid right here, that will convert the alkene into an epoxide. And it turns out that you can do the same thing to naphthalene. You can uh, epoxidize naphthalene on one of these double bonds to get to this structure, which is just called naphthalene oxide. So the question is, why is this possible? If naphthalene is aromatic, why can we do that? And uh, why does it not happen with benzene? So let's look at this. If we uh, consider naphthalene, remember that this whole bicyclic structure can be considered an aromatic with a resonance stabilization of 61 kilocals per mole. Now, if we epoxidize in the form that uh, is shown here, we're, we get to this structure, um, but notice that we still have a ring that looks like a benzene. So we know that that resonance stabilization is going to be approximately 30 ki 36 kilocals per mole. So we've gone from 61 to 36, which is a loss of 25 kilocals per mole, and that's a big loss. But keep in mind that the overall energetics for this transformation are also going to include the bonds that you're forming from carbon to oxygen, which are favorable, and also the breaking of the weak bond of the MCPBA reagent. So overall, this reaction uh, is going to be favorable as it must be in order to go forward. Okay, but the, the loss in aromaticity is what we're concerned with here, and we've lost 25 kilocals per mole. So big, but not insurmountable. If we consider the same reaction with benzene, right, if we were to epoxidize benzene to go to benzene oxide, we would have lost all 36 kilocals per mole, right? So that's a, a negative 36 um, in terms of energy. So both of these are uh, represent a, a major loss in resonance stabilization, but the naphthalene one is significantly less uh, unfavorable or less of a loss than, than benzene was. Okay, so um, as you get less uh, aromaticity, let's say, um, as you increase the ring size, it's easier and easier to do reactions on uh, those carbon-carbon those double bonds. Okay? <clears throat> so... A related question is why do we observe this regioselectivity for the epoxidation, right? So if we can treat uh, 
one set of, of these uh, double bonds um, as an alkene in certain reactions, why is it that we uh, exclusively see reaction at this position? Why not the other ones? Well, this is easy to explain again. So in this regioselectivity that I've shown, the one that actually uh, happens, we're left with a benzene ring and retaining at 36 kilocals per mole. So the accounting is, is a loss of 25 kilocals per mole of resonance stabilization. If we were to consider the other regioisomers, the other possibilities, we would see that in both of these, we will have lost all of the aromaticity of naphthalene, so minus 61. Now that's a massive difference between those two, and it's simply not going to happen. That's way too much of an energy loss. Okay, so in both of these, we will have lost that complete cyclic conjugation, all aromaticity, and that's why you see the exclusive regioselectivity for this process. Okay, we can consider another polycyclic aromatic, okay, anthracene. So now we have what looks like three benzene rings fused together. And again, we can go ahead and, re and consider the possible resonance forms for anthracene. Okay, so just go ahead and, and go through the process of shifting the double bonds around, and you'll see that there are four of these resonance forms. <clears throat> now, if we do the same thing we did with naphthalene and we put in our donuts for any ring that, that looks like a complete benzene, you'll get this picture. So uh, in, in two of these resonance forms, we have a single ring that feels uh, benzene-like, and then in another two resonance forms, we have um, two that uh, uh, we have two of the rings that look completely aromatic, okay. And so, if we look at the resonance stabilization of anthracene, we find that it's about eighty-four kilocals per mole, which is significantly lower than if anthracene uh, had the properties of just three isolated benzene rings, which we would expect to be three times thirty-six kilocals per mole or one hundred and eight kilocals per mole. So we've got 24 kilocals per mole difference in that stabilization. So again, as, as you continue to expand the conjugated system, even though it, it retains many of the properties of aromaticity, the aromatic stabilization uh, becomes less and less per ring. Okay? And so we can ask a, a very good question about anthracene now. If we were to do, uh, if we were to react anthracene with, with bromine, which of these products would we get? Now, the first thing that uh, is notable about this is that in the case of anthracene, you actually don't need a catalyst anymore, right? Remember with benzene, with naphthalene, we actually had to throw in a catalyst to make this type of process work. Otherwise, they weren't react enough to do anything. But with anthracene, uh, just bromine itself will, will do this chemistry. Um, and a lot of other chemistry can be done on anthracene. Um, and what that tells you is that in fact the uh, aromaticity, the resonance stabilization of anthracene is significantly less than, than with benzene. But okay, so which of these um, isomers would we expect to result from this reaction? And what you might want to do at this point is pause the video um, and consider uh, the answer um, and, and see, if, see if you get it right. Okay, so the answer here is B. Right? So we can see that by simply considering um, how much, if any, aromaticity is left over um, in each of these isomers. So in A, right, if, we, if we reacted here at the end, you can see that we would have lost all of the aromaticity. So all of that cyclic conjugation is gone, and so you will have lost all 84 kilocals per mole of the anthracene uh, aromaticity in A. So that one's, that one's the worst possible option. In C, we will retain a naphthalene system, so that's that's significantly better than A, right? So we will uh, have retained um, that that 61 kilocals per mole uh, stabilization in naphthalene. But if we look at B, compare the two, here we're left with two isolated benzene rings, right? And so each of those gets to count as 36 kilocals per mole. So react, uh, reaction of anthracene across these middle two carbons actually leaves us with 72 kilocals per mole uh, in terms of, of resonance stabilization. So we only went from 84 down to 72. But there's actually not such a big loss in, um, in aromaticity. Um, so B is far and away the best option here. 
um, is C is second best, but still too far away to be observed, and A is, is absolutely not going to happen. Okay, well, uh, we won't belabor the point, but uh, polycyclic aromatics um, occur very broadly. They're in interstellar space. You will find them um, in crude oil. You will also find them in um, any time uh, something gets burned without suffi sufficient oxygen. So, for example, benzopyrene uh, is found in cigarette smoke, um, and it's actually a very potent known carcinogen. Um, but we have a lot of different options here. I'm only showing just a very few of the somewhat more common of these. Um, and a lot of these have very uh, wonderful names. So, for example, uh, coronine is named such because it looks like a crown. Okay. The final uh, polycyclic aromatic that I wanted to quickly discuss is a very wonderful molecule called azulene. Um, you might recognize in the name uh, uh, azul, uh, which is, uh, stands for blue, right, in Spanish. Um, and that's uh, so named because this is a, a deeply and intensely blue molecule. Now, if you take a close look, you can see that this is actually an isomer of naphthalene, right? There's 10 carbons, there's uh, 10 total pi electrons. And so it's actually very much like naphthalene, but instead of being a 6-6 six, six system, what we've got is a 5-7 fuse system, okay? So uh, in terms of the Huckel numbers, it all adds up still. It, it actually... Uh, is still an aromatic, um, but whereas naphthalene is white or colorless, um, azulene is this intense, uh, wonderful blue. Now the reasons behind that are complicated, but um, what you uh, should understand is that azulene has this wonderful resonance form, right? So imagine taking this double bond and shifting those electrons into the five-membered ring and away from the seven-membered ring. And what you get out of that is this double aromatic, okay? So that the five-membered ring in this resonance form uh, gets to feel like an aromatic cyclopentadienyl anion, and the seven-membered ring gets to feel like a trochilium ion. Both of them get to feel like six pi um, electron aromatics, right? And so uh, what uh, can be measured in this is that azulene has a very large dipole moment uh, for a hydrocarbon. This is, this is a neutral hydrocarbon, and it is not charged, as this resonance form would suggest. Um, but it does have a large dipole moment, meaning that very much of the electron density is shifted to the five-membered ring portion of this molecule and away from the, the right-hand portion there. Right? And that's because of this, this aromatic character that it can take on uh, by that polarization. Now this looks um, fairly esoteric, I think, as a molecule, uh, but it turns out that there are some naturally occurring azulene isomers um, that show up in nature. And one of the, the best ones that I know of um, is uh, so the so-called blue milk mushroom. Okay, so here's a picture of this. And if you if you were to cut this, uh, this mushroom, out would leak this, this milky-like substance that's, that's just blue. It's as blue as a Smurf, okay? Um, and the, the molecule that's responsible for that wonderful blue color is simply a substituted azulene. And there are several of those that incur, occur in nature. Okay, so that ends our discussion of the polycyclic uh, aromatics.